Hey everyone, welcome back to Clinical Physio with me, Khalid Maidan. In today's video, we're going to be taking you through all you need to know about observation of the knee joint. We're going to be breaking down your observation into a view with our patient in standing and a view where our patient is supine on the plinth. And we're going to be highlighting key traits and common pathologies in each of these views. So as to not slow your video down, we're not going to be observing our patient's right and left knees during this video. But in clinical practice, we always want you to observe both so you can compare the two and inform your patient diagnosis. Now, before we go into our main video, a quick note on inflammatory signs and bony deformity. Like when you're observing any joint, you need to be aware of these things when you're looking at the knee to see if you can detect any signs of a trauma or an inflammatory pathology, for example. And just in case you've forgotten, our key three inflammatory signs are redness, swelling and bruising. So there are five key presentations in which you are highly likely to find inflammatory signs that every good clinician should be aware of. Number one is a trauma. With any trauma, your patient may suffer bony or soft tissue injury, such as a fracture or a ruptured muscle. Expect to find either swelling, bruising or deformity when observing the joint. For more severe cases, you may find more than one of these signs present. Number two is a bursitis, which put simply is inflammation of a bursa. Some bursae are more easily seen when they are inflamed. For instance, elecronon bursitis, or student elbow, can be easily visualized as the bursa is right beneath the subcutaneous layer of the skin. Others are not so easily visualized due to their anatomy. For instance, subacromial bursitis, where the bursa in question lies in a relatively deep position underneath the acromion. The amount of swelling seen therefore varies based on the anatomical site and the severity of inflammation. In the event of a bursitis, you may see redness on the skin and feel warmth on palpation. Always consider whether this could have been caused mechanically or whether an infection is responsible, in which case your patient may be systemically unwell. Number three is a tendonitis. When you look at the tendon in question, your patient may get swelling and redness in the most severe forms. Be aware though, don't rule out tendonitis if these signs are not present. You should also rely on your objective tests and mechanical signs. Number four is an infection or a cellulitis, where you may find redness or swelling, or in progressed cases even pus in the area of infection. Furthermore, look at your patient as a whole, do they feel unwell, or do they have a temperature? Finally, number five is arthropathies, which can be categorized into osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, and crystal arthritis. For osteoarthritis, you may expect to find an enlarged swollen joint, and in progressed cases, you may find hard swelling when you palpate the joint. With rheumatoid arthritis, you may find redness or swelling at the joint you are assessing, as well as other joints, particularly the hands and the feet. The onset of rheumatoid arthritis is insidious, so if your patient history indicates an absence of trauma, this should be considered a potential pathology. If you suspect this condition, you may wish to liaise with your patient's GP to conduct blood tests to rule out raised inflammatory markers. Crystal arthropathies represent a group of conditions associated with the deposition of mineralized material, mimicking crystals within joints and surrounding tissues. Gout and pseudogout are some of the most recognizable forms. These conditions present typically in a single large joint with redness and swelling and may well be warm to palpate. Like with rheumatoid arthritis, the important things to bear in mind are whether or not the onset of symptoms can be linked to a mechanical cause and whether mechanical aggravating or easing factors can be associated with the patient's symptoms. If not, a crystal arthropathy should be considered and the patient should consult with their GP for further investigation. So those are our inflammatory signs. Let's get into the main video. So now we're going to look at the observation of the knee joint with your patient in a standing position and first in an anterior view. First, it's important to know that you ask your patient to stand in the way that they stand in their everyday life, as that's how their knee is going to present in everyday life. So in this position, one of the first things we're looking at is the relative position of the knee. For example, do, does the patient present with knee more in a valgus position, like so, 
or more in a varus position, like so. In the, uh, the analogy is that you can, uh, analogy you can remember to remember the difference between valgus and varus, is that in a valgus position, it's more, there's less air going through the gap between the knees, and in a varus position, there's more air going through between the knees, and so I like to remember aerus varus in that sense. So with a valgus position, also known as genu valgus, we, we will know that there is going to be more likely degeneration in the medial tibiofemoral joint, whereas in a genu varus position, it's, your patient is more likely to present with degeneration in the lateral tibiofemoral joint. Next, you can look at foot position, because foot position will also tell you about how their weight transfers through their leg. So, for example, a more pronated foot position may tell you that there is more weight going through the inside of the patient's leg. And a more supinated foot position may tell you that there is more weight going through the lateral aspect of the patient's leg. And therefore, if they're reporting pain with, uh, for example, if your patient reports more pain on the medial side of their knee and they present with a pronated foot position, you may choose to adjust foot position and see if this Im influences their pain. Next to look at is the Q angle. If you draw an imaginary line between the patient's ASIS and the center of the patella, and then another imaginary line between the center of the patella and the tibial tuberosity, the angle created by these two lines forms the Q angle. And the reason this is important is because it puts different structural uh, force on the knee. For example, if there is an increased Q angle, if we, for example, um, pretend that our model's hip is out here and there's much more of an angled force like this, we are more likely to have compression on the lateral aspect of the patella against the lateral lip of the femoral, the lateral femoral sulcus. And therefore, this may increase pain in that region. It also may lead to increased stretch of the soft tissue structures on the medial side of the knee. So if they're presenting with an increased Q angle and medial pain, it might be for this reason. Um, next, we're going to look at a couple of other things, such as the tone of the quadriceps. We can compare that between the right and left side to get an idea of their, any potential differences in strength, as well as the patella position. For example, is the patella pulled more medially, which may indicate an increase in strength of medial muscular structures? Or is the patella pulled in a more lateral direction, which may give us more uh, give us an inclination of more strength of muscles on the lateral side, which may be causing that pull in that direction. So now we have our patient standing like so, so that we can observe the knee joint in a lateral view. As well as looking at global posture, such as thoracic posture and lumbar spine posture, the main thing we're looking at in this particular video is the relative angle of knee extension. So if we draw an imaginary line between the greater trochanter and the center of the lateral knee joint, and a second line between the center of the lateral knee joint and the lateral malleolus, we can measure the angle between these lines to gauge our patient's extension. In general, we would expect that they present with a straight line between the two angles, i.e. a zero angle. However, you may look for hyperextension where that angle exceeds zero degrees, which may tell you about laxity of the ligaments, not only around the knee, but potential hypermobility around the whole body. So next, we're gonna look at the knee in a posterior view. And there's a couple of things that we're gonna be looking at here. The first thing to look at is whether or not your patient presents with a Baker cyst. A Baker cyst presents as an enlarged swelling around the posterior aspect of the joint, also known as the popliteal space. And this distension of the posterior joint capsule can be caused by local irritation, such as within osteoarthritis, or if your patient presents with a hyperextended knee. Other things to look at here include the tone of the gastrocnemius heads, for example, the medial gastrocnemius head, which runs over here, and the lateral 
gastrocnemius head, which runs around here, as well as the medial hamstrings, the semitendinosus and the semimembranosus, as well as the bulk of the biceps femoris. And we're looking at these different bulks to see any differences in uh, any potential differences in strength between the right and the left sides. And one last thing to bear in mind is that when we're looking at the knee joint, either in a lateral view or a posterior view, as we've done in this video, uh, we're looking for any inflammatory signs of redness, swelling or bruising. We, meet, we need to make a note of where the, swell, where the inflammatory signs occur, what structures are around that area, so that we can make a judgment as to whether those structures are inflamed and therefore causing our inflammatory signs. And now we're observing our patient's knees in a posterior view. And there's a couple of things to look at here. The first is to see whether or not our patient presents with a Baker's cyst. And a Baker's cyst is a large distension around the posterior aspect of the joint capsule, also known as the popliteal space. And this distension of the joint capsule can occur for a couple of reasons, such as in your elderly patient who presents with osteoarthritis, or for a patient who presents with a hyperextended knee position. We're then going to look at various muscle bulks. For example, we're going to look at the medial gastrocnemius head, as well as the lateral gastrocnemius head. We're also going to look at the hamstrings, the medial hamstrings, which include semimembranosis and semitendinosis, as well as the biceps femoris, the lateral hamstring. And we're looking at the bulk of these various muscles to see if there are any differences between right and left, which may tell us, between, uh, which may tell us any differences in strength in those muscles between the right and the left. And finally, to remember, whenever you're observing the anterior, the lateral or the posterior view, we're looking for our inflammatory signs of redness, swelling and bruising. We need to consider where those inflammatory signs are occurring and what anatomy and what structures are in those areas so that we can make a decision as to what structures are being inflamed which is creating the inflammatory signs. So we now have our patient on the plinth in either a supine or a long sitting position. You may find that the patient often prefers to adopt the long sitting view so that they can see their knee as the therapist is observing it. They may like to discuss what the therapist sees in order to gain more understanding about their condition. If the patient is too uncomfortable when their knee is in full extension, you may choose to place a pillow underneath their knee to bring their knee into slight flexion, which can be more comfortable for them. So we've already observed the knee in the, stand, the anterior view of the knee in a standing position. So being here just allows us to even more opportunity to analyze deformity or the inflammatory signs of redness, swelling and bruising as the patient may be more relaxed lying down than they are standing up. As we said, we've got the anterior view of the knee here, but we can, as a therapist, we can also see the medial and the lateral sides of the knee if we need to. So common areas where we may find deformity or our inflammatory signs. Swelling around the knee joint will offer, often present itself around the joint as a whole as the fluid starts to disperse from the joint line. So you may commonly see swelling superior to the patella here, particularly for conditions such as a suprapatellar bursitis. Generalized swelling around the patella itself may be a sign of a pre bursitis, which is often referred to as housemaid's knee because of the implication that patients who excessive knee kneel can be more susceptible to this condition. A patella fracture or a, patella, a patellofemoral irritation may be other reasons for swelling around the patella. Injuries to soft tissues such as the menisci are more likely to present with swelling around the joint line um, and potentially more medially for the medial meniscus or laterally for the lateral meniscus rather than completely central where the patella tendon is. And from there we can also observe the medial side of the knee to observe the region of the medial collateral ligament and the lateral side of the knee to observe the region of the lateral collateral ligament and the anterolateral ligament to look for, for our inflammatory signs in these regions. 
We may also look directly at the center of the joint line where the patella or the quadriceps tendon is located to check for our inflammatory signs, such as in the case of an infrapatellar fat pad irritation. Finally, another important condition to mention is Osgood Schlatter's disease, which occurs due to excessive traction of the tibial tuberosity uh, away from the bone growth plate due to repeated contraction of the quadriceps muscle. And this bony prominence that occurs with Osgood Schlatter's typically presents amongst teenagers who engage in sporting activities from a young age, particularly in, on their standing or their jumping leg, which is when repeated knee extension with use of the quadriceps muscle in a weight-bearing manner is required. So let's summarize this video on observation of the knee joint. In standing, break down your observation of the knee into an anterior, lateral, and posterior view before bringing your patient into a supine position and observing the joint in an anterior view. Remember to compare both the affected and unaffected sides. When observing your patient, look for deformity and the inflammatory signs which include redness, swelling and bruising. You can also look for signs of specific pathology in each view as we've highlighted throughout the video. And that completes our video on observation of the knee joint. Next, I'd like to suggest you have a look at our other videos within the Knee Assessment Catalogue here on Clinical Physio, including palpation of the knee. Thank you as always for joining us, and we'll see you again soon, right here on Clinical Physio.